Hello and welcome to episode five of The Cutting Room. I'm Guy Cunningham. And I'm Sarah Bliss. Unfortunately, our co-host Jeremy Guzman is still away this week. If anyone's seen him, please contact our missing host helpline number at the bottom of our screens. In tonight's episode, we'll be discussing disability in the entertainment industry. One in five Australians identify as a person with a disability, but we don't always see this reflected on our screens. Fortunately, there are those within the industry working to change that. That's right, Guy. We'll be talking to Tracy Corbin Matchett, the CEO of Bus Stop Films. Bus Stop is a non profit organisation working to raise the profile of people with disabilities on both sides of the camera. We're also delighted to speak with Greg Gushush, a teacher and filmmaker with the Yarraville Special Developmental School. Now on to the headlines. First up, Madeleine Stewart, Steve Anthopoulos and Natalia Stavitskic have been announced as the winners of the Sustainability Filmmakers Fund. The fund is part of an initiative to provide opportunities for Australian filmmakers with a disability. Each filmmaker will receive mentorship and a $30,000 grant to create a short film that will premiere at the Sydney Film Festival. The festival itself will return to its usual in-person format in June of this year. The first 22 films have been announced, but the full program will be revealed on the 11th of May. Next up, the success of the movie Coda, about a high school student who is the only hearing member of her family, has sparked calls for cinemas to introduce more film sessions with open captioning to increase accessibility for deaf viewers. Not only that, Screen Australia has announced $1 million development funding for new film and television. This includes new projects from Lion director Garth Davis and Sophie Hyde, who helmed the new film Good Luck to You, Leo Grande, starring Emma Thompson. Funding also went towards adapting the comedy web series Girl Interpreted for television. We've got an amazing lineup of guests for this episode, so let's not waste any more time. Greg Gushush teaches students with disabilities at Yarraville Special Developmental School and has made several award-winning films about some of his students. Maddie Weeks spoke with Greg about the work he does with disabled students and how he creates films which bring the students' passions to life. Uh, my name is Maddie Weeks and we are here with Greg. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, my name is Greg Gusht. I am a classroom teacher at Yarraville Special Developmental School and I teach children with moderate to severe intellectual disabilities. How long have you been um, teaching students with special needs and what inspired you to work in this field? Uh, I've been teaching with, I've been I've been teaching children uh, with special needs for eight years, but I've worked in the disability sector for 17 years. So I worked with adults. I did outreach and case management work before that. Uh, I also worked as a support worker in adult day programs. Uh, and I wanted a change. I wanted something different. So I went back to uni, got my teaching degree and uh, went to teach children. <laughs> And so you're a filmmaker, is that correct? Before I, before I went into the disability sector, I used to work in the film industry. So I did go through film school. I, I then I worked as a camera operator a lot of the time. I uh, wrote and directed small projects. Um, uh, yeah, and, just, and also worked on corporate multimedia um, projects as well. That, that was your like past life. And what, when did you decide to work with your students to make films? So in my second year of teaching at Yarraville uh, SDS, uh, the principal then uh, threw me a flyer uh, from the Focus on Ability Film Festival, which is a great festival. I recommend yeah. any budding filmmakers to enter. Uh, but it's, uh, it was basically a festival that was encouraging uh, stories to uh, talk about the abilities of people with disability. I thought, oh, this is great. This, she knew my background, so she gave me that flyer. And, and it spoke really highly of me. And so the first project that I, it was, it was a little bit of a time issue because we didn't have much, much to go before submissions had to be entered. So I made a project, which was essentially a student uh, having, uh, videoing himself and his classroom mates and his day inside the classroom. And that became the small film. It was called I Am David. And it was about his little, um, well, almost his little routines and his fixation. What are the rewards of working with these students and doing these? Like, what are your, some of your favourite parts of your day? Uh, the biggest reward I would find is uh, the growth of confidence for the student. You know, uh, that happens throughout. 
um, yeah. that happens throughout. And so it's it's always you see that um, as you're building the relationship and the uh, trust. Um, but furthermore, after the project, it's it's also the the communication and the trust that you build with the families, you know, and yeah. the attention that you give the student. All of a sudden, the student had a platform, they've had a voice, uh, and now they're being noticed. And that is the biggest reward. These films must be like so impactful to, for the students. Like they're learning so much, not just about filmmaking, but about themselves. Um, how yeah. would you say your relationships with your students have kind of evolved throughout filming and like like writing and like directing it all? Uh, well, as I mentioned, it's really about mostly about trust. You yeah. know, uh, yeah. these kids rely a lot on support. Uh, they, 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 some of them have very high complex behaviors as well. And so uh, it's a, it really does uh, depend on trust. You're gonna put this child in front of a camera and then you're gonna put them up on the screen. You, they, they need to be able to trust you that you're gonna do the right thing. Like one of the challenges that I would say, for instance, is that I, I as the teacher can steer the technical aspects of it, uh, but the story and the ideas keep moving and floating around. And so from a filmmaking point of view, that can be a little bit frustrating because you wanna get the idea and you want it to stay solid and you, you know what you're doing, but, but that's where almost like that documentary idea of filmmaking has to come into it because it's going to evolve uh, sometimes through lack of communication at the beginning, you realize that the idea was different and your mind, your idea hadn't been uh, quite understood or expressed uh, yeah. as well as the child's perhaps. And so, so that's, you know, it, it really is about confidence. It's about trust um, between each other, between myself and the student. What are some ways that filmmaking empowers disadvantaged or special needs individuals? It gives a voice. Yeah. And it's, whether whether it's through the end product because you've got a story or whether it's actually the ability to be able to point a camera use this technology that is so accessible now to be able to communicate you know yeah. because for a lot of these children communication is still a difficulty uh, well effective communication i should say and yeah. so that ability to be able to tell story through visuals is a really powerful medium I, I want to ask, obviously, the past two, almost three years now of COVID have been rough for everybody. How has COVID altered the special education like system? It must have been hard, right? Yeah, the two years of on and off lockdowns were mm. extremely difficult. But every lockdown, we seem to get a little bit better with, you know, with the way we were using the technology. Because the, those platforms are there, the instant communication that we have with families has improved. Uh, the working day dramatically because we can send out messages straight away uh, with photos, with video. Uh, it, and so within these platforms, and so it's almost like a social media community uh, of learning. Uh, the way we're using video to uh, say, to tell message, you know, at the beginning, when I look at those, some of those videos we were making in the first lockdown, mm -hmm. they were far too long. And then by, by the end of it, it was, we were tight. We knew how to tell. And so, so those sorts of skills uh, we practiced as teaching staff. Yep. The families themselves got a better glimpse into what we do at the school. And so yeah. at the end, I feel like the best result that came out of the lockdowns is the fact that there's a greater, a tighter working relationship between the families, uh, the students and us as teachers. And so that's been wonderful. Uh, we didn't have that before mm -hmm. lockdown and we have that now. So, uh, and I'm hoping that we can only grow that from here oh that's wonderful it's so nice to hear that some good things came out of all that <laughs> it didn't feel like it, it didn't feel like it <laughs> but i'm glad at the end that we can sort of look back <laughs> Got there. well thank yeah. you so much this has been so wonderful greg uh thank you, so uh, much. Thank back, you Maddie. back to you guys in the studio we'll be right back after these very important advertorial messages Welcome back. This week we're speaking to individuals and organisations promoting inclusivity within the screen industry. And one of these organisations is Bus Stop Films. 
They work with marginalised and disabled creatives to provide them with opportunities to work in film and TV. Additionally, they work to improve representation of people with disability on both sides of the camera. I spoke with Bus Stop Film's CEO Tracy Corbin Matchett about some of the great work they do in creating a space for disabled artists to learn and grow in their craft. How did Bus Stop Films come about and what is its mission? So Bus Stop Films was established in 2009 by our amazing co-founders Genevieve Clay-Smith and Eleanor Winkler. Uh, they were baby filmmakers at the time making, um, you know, amazing films. Uh, Genevieve was working with Down Syndrome New South Wales on a film-based project that was interviewing participants who um, were looking for opportunities to work and they were being connected to people within their networks for job opportunities and just their experiences of work. And she got to meet the amazing Jared O'Dwyer, the actor, one word. Um, and Jared um, was a young man with Down syndrome and he really wanted to be an actor and he was super talented. And I think on their first meeting, he recited the um, soliloquy from um, the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet. And um Genevieve was just like, you know, other people in their networks were getting jobs in accountancy and, and, and shops and, and Jared really wanted to be an actor. Um, so together they worked and created this amazing film which Genevieve wrote um, called Be My Brother and they worked to set the film production team up inclusively and had people with disability behind the camera as well and Jared on screen in the lead role. And that film went on to win Tropfest, which at the time was one of the biggest um, short film festivals in the world and Jared won um, Best Actor and that really gifted the idea to Genevieve and Eleanor to establish Bus Stop Films and we're so glad they did and that sort of grew from you know hosting that little group in a friend's lounge room to a full film, um, 40 week film studies curriculum through our accessible film studies program and the organisation it is today. Um, Bus Stop exists to change the sort of low expectations that the community has around people with disability and other marginalised groups. And we use filmmaking in the film industry to do that. Um, we do that in three ways, through education, through our Accessible Film Studies program, which we deliver at RMIT um, on Sundays there, which is really fantastic. We had such a, a great start. We actually had to put two classes on. Um, we make amazing films, uh, really high quality, entertaining, engaging films at screening festivals all around the world. They broadcast on, you know, SBS, ABC, Foxtel. Um, we really pride ourselves on making high quality films because we know when people see our films, they connect disability and we want to make sure that they have a really positive experience around that. And a lot of work around advocacy in terms of authentic casting and pathways to employment for people with disability in the screen industry. Um, so that our mission and purpose is to sort of disrupt the screen industry in terms of how it produces content and make sure that it produces content that's made inclusively um, and really connects to the disability community and uses filmmaking as a medium for change. So take me through your inclusive toolkit and how that can help sort of content makers become more appropriately inclusive. It's a really great resource for filmmakers at any level. I, I, um, you know, whether you're studying at uni and making your graduate project or you're a commercial producer or any aspect, you know, hair and makeup or set design lighting, just some resources and tools about how to think about your production, uh, the pre-production time, managing people with disability on set and how you can make your sets and projects more inclusive. So it looks at things like um, you know, a bit around disability pride and disability language, um, how to support people with disability on set in terms of access to communications, accessible sets, um, directing an inclusive set, really changing. It really comes down to an attitude of, yes, I can do this. And the, the toolkit just gives resources to practitioners to think through an inclusive lens when they're looking at their productions. And I think it's a really great guide um, when you're going into any production to be a, feel more confident, support people with disability, but also when we apply an inclusive remit to our productions, it often benefits us all. You know, when we um, look at how we have lunch together or if there's plenty of parking or if we take regular breaks or if we're really mindful of respect and dignity to each other, they're things that benefit us all. And when we're, you know, the producer or the AD who has courage of making sure that set is safe and run, run smoothly. 
when you're looking at inclusion, you should look at it just as importantly as you do COVID safety or, you know, regular safety. Uh, um, you know, when you're taping down cords so that no one chips up on them, you should be also making sure that you've got a culturally safe set. Now, representation is a real hot button issue these days in film and, and media in general. Why is it uh, authentic disability representation important? It is really, really important. Um, often, even though people with disability are 20% of the population, so it's likely that you know someone with people with disability, if you don't really have a strong relationship or that connection to that community, often the connection or view you have of disability is what you see on screen. So we need it to be authentic. We need to see people with disability playing themselves and playing um, characters um, with disability should be authentically cast. We also should see people with disability on screen just being on screen, doing other stuff, being the mum, being the lawyer, being the doctor, being the school teacher, just being being the villain, not always yeah. being the person that needs to be <laughs> saved or the kind, sweet person, right. um, just being. And visibility is so important. If we can see it, we can be it. It's also really important um, as consumers of content, we really want to see authenticity, when I'm watching something and there's a person with disability or a character, I'm on my phone. I am Googling. I'm looking up IMDb. I'm checking you out. I want to make sure that person legitimately has that disability. And it's like, it's really like, oh, feeling when you realise that actor doesn't, but it's yeah. a really uplifting feeling when you're like, yes, there's my community on screen. And it's really, really powerful, whether it's in advertising or a short film or on a TV series, it's really powerful to see authentic representation or representation that doesn't perpetuate myths or stereotypes or take away the empowerment of that community telling our own stories. I mean, we've seen the buzz around Coda. I freaking loved it. Um, I'm Hannah right Peering, loved it. It's such a great film. Yep. Um, it is so powerful to see deaf culture on screen. We saw amazing response to things like Peanut Butter Falcon, authentic disability representation, beautiful. Absolutely. And how do you think the Australian screen industry can change to become more inclusive with people um, of disability? The Australian screen industry can um, really support authentically made content um, we've seen a great change in the commissioning guidelines from the ABC, SBS and other broadcasters around uh, underrepresented groups. So it's not just people with disability, it's looking at that intersectional side of things of people's gender, ethnicity, cultural background, um, the LGBTIQ community, women, carers, looking at how we crew up above and below the line roles. Um, production finance guidelines are changing uh, in, in the state screen agencies. Like, you know, if you have this amount of production finance, you need to put an attachment on for underrepresented groups. Tell, support more um, stories to be told by community uh, authentically and that they can drive it. But that's not to say that um, people with disability can't partner with or shouldn't be able to partner with non-disabled people to tell their story. Yeah. The most often the most great stories come out of great partnerships with people from diverse communities. So our beautiful film Groundhog Night um, that you can see on ABC is a partnership between Genevieve Playsmith and Emily Dash. Emily is an amazing writer and actor who lives with cerebral palsy. Genevieve is an amazing writer, director and leader in inclusive filmmaking. Together they wrote that story and that script and brought it to life. They both acted in it, Genevieve directed it. That is a really great shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder equal partnership that fruited something amazing. So um, invest in more content and support more content that includes people with disability and look at things. It's easy to do. Like if you've got a cafe scene, why can't you have people with disability as your extras? Exactly. If you've got crew roles, editing, post-production, hello, desktop, a great um we've had great opportunities for people within our cohort who are on the autism spectrum love those editing and post-production roles because it's quiet um there's a list you follow the list and the directions their disability actually enhances their capacity in, yeah. in that space um so uh you know australia is we're great storytellers um uh, just tell more stories with by and about people with disability absolutely an organization that deserves as much attention as possible Coming up, this week's poll.
Welcome back to the program. This week in the polls, we've decided to have a closer look at how film festivals have increased accessibility for hearing impaired audiences and how online festivals may help with allowing everybody the opportunity to enjoy films. Remember, the way to be a part of the polls is to check us out on Facebook at The Cutting Room RMITV or on Instagram to make sure your voice is heard in our weekly polls. All right, let's go to the polls now. Question one, has the pandemic discouraged you from attending local film festivals in 2022? Yes, some people have been deterred. 8.7% of, of the people have been deterred, but a massive, overwhelming number here in the no category, which is fantastic. Who's going to let a pesky little disease like COVID stand in the way of some good new movies? And it's great to see you out there still enjoying local content. Question two, what genres of film are you most excited about in a film festival this year? Now, I must admit, when I saw this, I was a bit, I was a bit shocked. I, I myself do the polls as well, and I put myself in the drama category because there's something about uh, independent film when it's drama that's really nice and gritty and it's lovely to see. But I was expecting probably a more dominant sort of comedy and action sort of a thing. But drama's coming in at the top with 34%, comedy coming in second at 26%, and followed by thriller at 21%. Question three, what form of film festivals have you attended since COVID started? In-person festivals in the green, both in-person and online in the blue, online in the yellow and no festivals in the light blue, which is taking out the biggest category, but that's okay. We don't judge you. It's all right. COVID's full on. <laughs> but next question, looking forward, do you plan on transitioning to online streaming festivals? Now we're seeing a lot of this sort of happening, especially in the COVID world and everything's coming back in now. But what I like to see in this is that there's only a tiny little sliver of people who are just going to do it online now. They've had enough of in-person things and they're just going to do it online because that's the way they like it. Most people here, the rest of this, this is the mix of both and this is no, I'd rather attend in events in person to get not in there and nice and gritty with the films. Has COVID affected how you find new independent films? Yes, there are easier ways in green. No, I prefer film festivals and it is neither easier nor harder to find these films. Massive over 60% there in that, in that category. And finally, question six, have you been less inclined to pay for online film festivals? Yes, I'd rather pay for an, a cinema experience. In my opinion, it's something you can get involved in and it's tangible and tactile and you can really sort of feel the, the excitement. And I think that's something that a lot of these people are reflecting here in these scores. But only just behind is I enjoy both online and in-person screenings. So, I mean, I think it does open up that whole category there of being able to attend international film festivals, which is also a fantastic part of film festivals. Earlier on in the program, we touched on how the 2022 best winner, CODA, which is led by deaf actors Troy Kotzer, Marley Matlin and Daniel Durant, reignited conversation about the accessibility of movies for fans who are deaf or hard of hearing. Many within the deaf community have long held that accommodations such as personal captioning technology are not as user-friendly or inclusive as they could be. This begs the broader question, how can films be made more accessible for audiences with visual, auditory or intellectual disabilities? What do you think, Guy? Well, I think it's uh, if you don't include closed captioning and audio description, then you're cutting out a, a potential audience that, of people who can get involved in, in your film. Mm. And audio description these days is coming in in a huge way. Um, voiceover artists all over the place are sort of getting involved now. I know that it's really quite popular on Netflix um, as in the American laws there are very different sort of rules around accessibility when it comes to um, blind accessibility and audio description. Uh, and a lot of uh, local film festivals also have it and cinemas also when they do a big new release they have accessibility cinemas where people can book in for an audio descriptive um, session or a, a closed caption session and then find that they can actually see the movie that they want to see when it's coming out. Mm, yeah and I believe that SBS and ABC also have audio description now on at least 14 hours worth of content per week, which is fantastic. 
That's awesome. Mm. That's really good. I, what I want to know is, do they, can you select your audio description category? I mean, is this something we can go down in the future where you can get Morgan Freeman imitators doing it, maybe a, you know, a Steve Irwin sort of an accent, if you're looking for the Australian accent audio description, make, turn it up a bit, or do we have like genre specific ones? Do you have like a creepy, scary audio description I mean, this has all got to be part of it. If you, do, if you had a thriller movie, you don't want to hear sort of, oh, get hey, some blokes walking down the stairs. Woo! It cuts through the actual thriller action of it, I think. That sounds amazing, and I'm sure you'll be all over that. I will. So being a filmmaker guy, how do filmmakers get audio description into their films? Well, closed captions never been easier. So there's in, in Premiere, there's a quick button and you can pretty much caption your whole whole film in, in very sort of few tiny little steps. Audio descriptions, not as easy. You can sit there and, and do a subtrack and then record it yourself. But there's also companies that you can access who can actually go in and do that for you at a production sort of level. And a lot of festivals actually require you to have those accessibility options, which is fantastic. It means that everyone can enjoy your film. But you have to do that when you're submitting them and also submit them sort of extra copies of it if you get pre-select, if you get selected. Oh, excellent. Now, before we leave you tonight, we have our weekly recommendations brought to you from In Review. I can't go past this year's Oscar winner for Best Picture, Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Supporting Actor, Coda. And also, a standout from last year's Best Picture lineup was Sound of Metal, which features many members of the deaf community, including Paul Racy, who was in a great band called The Hands of Doom, who performed live in ASL. The Peanut Butter Falcon was a feel-good road trip film that deserves checking out. It follows Zach, a young man who has been as assigned to a nursing home due to his Down syndrome, but escapes to go into wrestling school and live out his dreams. Zach is played by Zach Gottsagen in a breakout performance alongside Shia LaBeouf and Dakota Johnson. Some very funny and memorable moments throughout. Um, also, I'm really looking forward to that one, I must say. Oh, well, Shia LaBeouf, who isn't looking forward to it? <laughs> also, Crip Camp on Netflix is a great doco about a summer camp for disabled teens that was nominated for Best Documentary in 2021. I'm also looking forward to watching Reed Davenport's new documentary, I Didn't See You There, which tackles some of the topics we've discussed in tonight's episode. And that's everything we have for another episode of The Cutting Room. Join us next week for more insights into the streaming industry.